Welcome to the Jack Mountain Bushcraft Podcast, episode 78. Welcome to the Jack Mountain Bushcraft Podcast with your host, Jack Mountain Bushcraft School founder and master main guide, Tim Smith. I'm your host, Tim Smith. I'm a registered master main guide, and in 1999, I founded the Jack Mountain Bushcraft School. We help people become more skilled, more knowledgeable, more experienced, and more confident outdoors by using traditional skills, a few simple tools, and field-based experience. Whether you're looking to go from city slicker to competent outdoor professional, want to experience a remote expedition, or just want to learn a few new outdoor skills, we've got you covered. You can check out the show notes to this and all of our podcasts at blog.jackmtn.com. When you're there, click on the podcast button. And if you enjoy the show, please leave us a review on iTunes. Lastly, the best way to keep up with our programs and trips is to join our email newsletter. And you can do that at jmbnews.com. Hello and welcome back to the Jack Mountain Bushcraft podcast. We've had a bit of a hiatus here that wasn't planned, but sometimes when we get busy running a semester... uh, Wheels come off of certain vehicles, and the wheels of the podcast bus apparently came off a couple of weeks ago. Because and we, Tim's truck. I stole them. And my truck, because we've been just too busy with our day-to-day to take the time out to uh, to record. But now we're back. We're certain that uh, at least one of you, of our four listeners, missed us. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> and yeah, so we are just wrapping up week seven of our nine-week fall semester course um we've been busy testing people on various skills canoe acts wet weather fire we've been busy working on all of our digital assessment systems we've been busy cranking out the crafts and the field experiences um yeah i took a couple of the students out on the river for the last couple days um gorgeous i'd never been on the aroostook this time of year because the water is usually so low but we had a big glut of rain over the last few days and it just it jumped right up and got to see all the fall foliage and the moose and stuff like that it was it was great yeah it's the end of september we're recording this in the guide shack the morning of saturday september 28th um yeah we're just about at peak foliage here in central Arista county and it is gorgeous and we have had quite a bit of rain in the last couple of weeks to bring the river right up yeah um, I think a week and a half ago, we were at like something like 130 cubic feet per second in the Aroostook here in Masardis, and now we're at about 800. So yeah. about 500 cubic feet per second in the Aroostook here makes just anywhere in the drainage canoeable. Yeah. Um, but when we're below, say, 300 or so, <sighs> it's pretty scratchy when you get further up river. So yeah, it's beautiful now. We've got plenty of water. We can go anywhere, but... But we won't be because we've got a busy final yeah. two weeks of the semester schedule. But if we had our way, we'd be packing up the boats this morning and headed up to the headwaters. Oh, yeah. Um, but we don't have our way. No. <laughs> uh, I haven't other... gotten my way in three years. <laughs> uh, yeah. Other things that we've been up to here uh, is we are really embracing the idea of the scythe as the second oh, tool yeah. of yeah. the of the homestead right so you know for us around here you know that we are very big on axes the axe is the tool of the forest you know no moving parts a chainsaw is great but you got to carry gas and there's lots of ways for it to break so we spend a lot of time working with axes here and so that's for the forest and for the field we have um a couple acres of of uh field at this point and we're going to clear another acre in moose vegas this year um, and I've been going back and forth as to, you know, to, should we get a tractor? Should we pay somebody to mow for us? And we instead, we've had a scythe <clears throat> here for forever. And but we're going to go all in on scythes and really make that the 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 basis of our homesteading effort. So scythe the field, use all the hay that we mow to mulch the garden. And that's our plan moving forward. So if you're really interested in scything or if you're interested in super low tech ways to maintain a homestead, um, we're working on that. So another interesting thing you could come up here and learn. Yeah. 
I did our field while Tim was out of town as sort of a surprise for him. And it was, it was one of the most pleasurable things I've ever done. Like just put your head down and just walk back and forth in a field for a few hours. And, uh, I grew up being pretty athletic, but I've never felt more like physically. I bet if I did that every day, I would be at, I would be the most fit I'd ever been in my life. Yeah. Great rotational motion. Yeah. Awesome for your lower back. Um, you know, I equate it to like, I enjoy swinging an axe. Yes. I physically enjoy it. I enjoy, you know, trying to get that exact perfect angle of impact when you hit the wood. So for me, that's something that's very physically pleasurable. I have a chainsaw. It is an awesome tool. I really don't like using it. It's loud. It's smelly. Um, you know, it's, I, I, again, I, I, I understand and value its use and its place in the woods, but it's not something that I physically enjoy. Same thing. We have a weed whacker. I don't enjoy using it. It's loud. It's smelly. It vibrates like crazy. But with a scythe, again, similar to an axe, I really enjoy using it. You know what's not pleasurable, though? What? And this is just a word of warning to the people that start scything. Make sure there are no hornet's nests anywhere in the field before you start scything. I got stung pretty good. Came up on a hornet's nest and hit a piece of it and you weren't able to defend yourself from the hornets with the scythe uh th- my weapons were useless against them tim is what i'm saying it was it was yeah not pleasurable the opposite what if of you had like painful? a suit of armor that was impervious to hornet stings uh i don't know if the technology is there tim like a knight of the round table we'd have to get it we'd have to cut the corners off the table first of all <laughs> Uh, yeah so scything (laughs) hornets Uh, bad hornets bad but yes the scythe and the axe i think there's an article coming up in my mind for sure the two first the first two tools of the homestead yeah um cool so we've got some current events coming up yeah um again we have two weeks left in the fall semester and then on October uh, 10th to October, that can't be right. October no, October 11th. 11th to <laughs> October 11th to October 13th is the Brush Fire Rendezvous here at the Jack Mountain Bushcraft Field School. Yep. Um, 15 bucks a day f- or what, 45 for three days. Yep. Uh, and we're looking forward. We've got a good crowd. Looks like we've got uh, some real characters coming. And we're going to have a lot of cheap laughs, go over a lot of traditional woodsy stuff. We'll probably have some hot tents set up, look at some winter gear, look at a bunch of stuff. We'll have a lot of food events going on, sauerkraut, wines, other fermented products. We'll probably do some bannock Mm -hmm. bake-offs. So lots of fun activities planned. Um, Not a whole lot of super formal education. We don't have 50 courses that we're going to try to cram into the weekend. But if you're curious about anything that we do and you're here, you know, and you ask, then somebody will be sure to show you. Yeah. Um, I think we've got guys who are interested in making low-tech campfire knives, things of that nature. We'll probably do some canoe polling demos, maybe some fly casting, archery, stuff of that of that nature. For sure. Um, so we've got that coming, and you can register on the website. There's still plenty of room available. Immediately following the Brush Fire Rendezvous, that Monday morning, we're going to wake up. And I know a bunch of the guys going on this trip will be at Brush Fire, but we're going to wake up, and we're headed southeast down to the border to the St. Croix River. We're going to run the section from Vanceboro to Loon Bay over that week, and it's going to be an advanced canoe polling course. So we're going to, you know, we don't, it's not that long of a trip. We don't have tons of miles to make every day. So we'll get into camp early. We'll stash the gear. We'll do a whole bunch of camp stuff, like a lot of uh, baking, things like that. But we're going to be focused on moving up, down, and across the rapids in the St. Croix in a very uh, controlled and safe and predictable manner. So if you're interested in that trip, there's still, I think there's still two spots open on that trip, but they're going quick. Um... And you've got to have your own boat for that. So if you don't have a boat, we can get you one. You can rent one. Um, but the cost of the trip does not include a boat. So that yeah. would be a little extra. But it includes, you know, the the other usual trip stuffs. So we've got that coming up. And then early next... Uh, actually, it's still September. So early November. I was going to say mm-hmm. next month, but that would be factually inaccurate. Uh, that would have been. Would have been. Early November, the <laughs> Snow Walkers Rendezvous in Vermont. Yeah. And this is a fantastic event. 
Uh, I have been going there since they just about when they started, which was a long time ago. Um, but uh, this year, there's a new instructor going to be at the Snowwalker. Hi! <laughs> I'm a bushcraft instructor. <laughs> yeah, I'll be running uh, two workshops on outdoor cooking, um, <clears throat> just using the systems that we do, and sort of a little intro on that, doing all the, uh, yeah, Bannock and a reflector oven, all that kind of stuff. And then the last day of the event, I'll be running a, a workshop on burned spoons, and so everybody will get to come in and... So see burnt, how we do that. Burnt bread is the first workshop, and the second. If one, I'm cooking, it's definitely burnt bread. Burnt <laughs> It'll definitely be charcoal briquettes is what we'll be making in a awesome. reflector oven. Um, <laughs> yeah, other big news. If you follow our stuff online, you knew that we had uh, the Smith family had planned to not be living in New Hampshire anymore. We put our house on the market last summer. The house did not sell, so we are in New Hampshire for the winter. So I'm going to redo our winter schedule here pretty quick. We will be offering folk school courses in New Hampshire um, and things of that nature. And we will be, I'm not 100% sure that I'm changing the dates for the Boreal Snowshoe Expedition. I don't believe I am, but I'm going to look at all that as soon as we're done with the fall semester. So we should have all the dates updated by Halloween at the latest. So you can look for that. Um, what we're not going to change, though, are the dates for the spring semester. And this leads us into our topic for today. And the topic is why challenge is good. Why hard is a benefit, not a curse. Yeah. So the spring semester 2020 is the first uh, semester that we are titling the Wilderness Guide Training Semester. And it's going to differ from our usual Wilderness Bushcraft Semester in that we are going to focus and spend much more time on the trail. So this spring, um, this is going to be a hard, physically hard course, right? We are going to cover roughly 300 miles over the course of the nine weeks, and that's through three big paddling trips. The first big paddling trip we're going to do is the St. John River, and then we will run the Aroostook River, and we are going to finish with the Allagash River. So the St. John is about 105 miles the Allagash is about 99, and then the Aroostook's about 70, and then we're going to add in a couple of probably shorter trips. Yeah. So it'll be right around 300 miles. Um, and we are planning to start that course in early April. Early April here is still a winter environment, right? There's still plenty of snow on the ground. Um, so the benefits of doing it that way are that uh, participants on the course are going to get the instruction for winter outings, so that'll include snowshoes and snowshoeing, winter tents, wood stoves, all those sorts of things. And then obviously all of the canoe-oriented uh, things. And we're of the belief here that it takes about 100 miles to learn how to paddle a canoe and about 100 miles to learn how to pole it. So over the course of 300 miles, people will be very adept at those skills by the end of the course. Um, we're not changing the curriculum. We're still going to run, you know, have all of the stuff that we do during semester course. Um, but we are just going to be doing a lot of that stuff on the trail. Yeah. Um, so, you know, longer days, lots of physical work. Uh, so if you're planning on coming to that course, you know, please uh, do some physical work on yourself before you before you show up because it's going to be physically taxing. Don't lay on the couch for six straight months and then and then show up thinking that you'll be uh, good to go because you probably won't be. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a fun time to a lot of the skills that we teach um, when we do them in camp. They can sort of be uh, propped up by the infrastructure that's here, but if you can accomplish a lot of the tasks we talk about, like wet weather, fire, or um, yeah, polling, anything like that. If you can do that stuff on a trail where it's your only option to get things done, you get a really good understanding for it. Um, and that's, you know, I think why we've wanted to do this kind of semester for so long is that um, it just it just is a level of understanding that you can't accomplish in camp. Yeah. Uh, expeditions are where dumb ideas go to die. Yeah. There are lots of dumb ideas. Like if you're car camping and you've got, Hey, look at my new piece of kit and it's a total disaster. Like 
it doesn't really matter because you can always just hop in the car and yeah. warm up or or something else. But if you're out in a remote location, you're relying on what you've got for the next hundred miles or two weeks. And you know, if it's if it's horrible and it's no good at all, and uh, or if it breaks, or if it breaks, or yeah. you know, you doing things unsafely, there are serious repercussions for your actions or for your cho- poor choice of whatever. Right. So I think that you know things are. When they're tested by expedition, when they're trail tested, that's got to be somebody's got to use that like trail tested as a as a gear like advertising slogan or something. I don't know. I I can't believe that I just came up with that. So I must have seen it somewhere because I'm not that smart. <laughs> um, but yeah, when things work on the trail, um, especially in adverse weather conditions yeah. like early spring up here can be cold. You know, we've been out and gotten you know, seven inches of snow in middle of May. And, yeah. and that just makes everything a little more challenging, a little more real. Yeah. Um, you know, and winter trips, obviously, you know, that's where the sort of the rubber meets the road. If you're out for a couple of weeks in the winter time, you know, things have to work. Otherwise <laughs> really bad things mm-hmm. happen. So, so yeah, we're super excited about this one coming up. Um, and apparently other people are too. We've the it's half full already, and we haven't even finished the fall semester. Yeah. Um, and we also haven't really promoted our new um, relationship with the University of Maine branch. We're going to be doing all that stuff when this semester ends, and we get a little bit of time. So, so if you're really interested in this uh, spring semester, if you want to go out and really push yourself physically, um, yeah, get in touch. Get uh, go to the website and sign up before all the spots are gone because I don't anticipate that they'll be lasting for too much longer. Um, so one of the th- topics that we talk about around here is the idea of having a baseline. Yeah. So a baseline for your skills, a baseline for your infrastructure. So for example, at the field school, we have very low baselines with regards to infrastructure. We have a library cabin, and then we have the guide shack that sort of serves as an office. And we have a pavilion that is just a big roof. Um, But other than that, everything is outside. You just blew my mind. Pavilions really are just big roofs. Yeah. There's nothing else to them. It's a fancy French word for big roof. That can't be right. It's true. Is that true? Yeah. If I look that up and it isn't true, I'm going to be really hurt. (laughs) Because you just... just Changed my whole perspective on well, life. Well, it's like foyer is like little room for shoes and coats. What? Yeah. You're telling me different words in other languages mean different things than what I think? No, I'm not saying that at all. Are you putting words in my mouth? I don't know. <laughs> Am I? Anyway, the idea <laughs> of a baseline. What is the level of infrastructure and or technology that you're used to using? Yeah. So during a semester course, people are out here cooking over campfire. So their their kitchen baseline would be, you know, a tripod that they made in the woods with a galley pole and maybe some pot hooks or cooking chains. And they can make all their food that way. That doesn't mean that we don't appreciate like a, a fully functional, modern, outfitted kitchen. I think we appreciate it more. Probably, yeah, I would, yeah. I would agree with you. But the idea is that if they take away your, your fancy, you know, $4,000 propane range stove or whatever... Like people who've done the semester course have a different baseline. So they say, oh, okay, no big deal. I'm fine with just a little fire that I can make myself, right? So the idea of lowering baselines is a benefit. Similarly, if your baseline for where you sleep at night for lodging is like the penthouse of a fancy hotel or something, and then, oh, you know, you have to, you have to sleep in like a crappy hotel room or something uh, and you're really upset about it, you know, that would be a change in baseline. But again, if your baseline is a shelter that you made in the woods out of natural materials, you have a low baseline and anything in addition to that is a huge bonus, right? Again, if you live in a dirt hut or like a grass hut or something, log a stick hut for a couple of months, then you really appreciate, you know, any... uh, addition to that any upgrade of the baseline right so it's just an an addition your baseline might still be living in a strip in a stick hut but um you know you 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 have lucked out for the short term and you're living in a nice modern house yeah and i think that uh uh, the lowering of the baseline is a big thing that will happen in the spring is because because we're on trail so much you know like you said we have a very limited infrastructure at the field school but there is still some 
Um, so if your baseline becomes that we're moving every day, um, you're packing up and you're comfortable with that. Then when you get back to camp and there's like a well that water comes out of and you don't have to boil it, that's something that you appreciate immensely rather than it just being accepted as the norm, right? Yeah. Yeah. So in lowering your baseline, you know, it makes life more challenging. There's more stuff to do, but only through challenge do we experience growth. Yes. If we're very comfortable and not pushing our pushing our boundaries at all ever, we don't grow. Mm-hmm. But And when we're severely challenged, you know, the goal is that through instruction and prior experience, the as the semester goes on, the challenges become greater and uh, we rise to those challenges and as a result experience massive amounts of growth. That's the, you know, big picture looking at it from the treetop uh, version. That's what we hope to achieve yeah. by making things more challenging. It's never challenge for the sake of challenge. No. Like manufactured hardship, we don't really do that around here. Well, we do, but it involves eating massive amounts of food. Right. As a two students last night attempted and... I think we're unsuccessful. We're eating. unsuccessful with the four pound burrito challenge in Prescott. It's just man was not meant to man was not meant to reach those heights. I don't think four well, pounds of food. Well, some is, men have. Yeah, but Jeremy and Glenn both did it in the yeah, spring. Yeah, but they. I just don't. know. They're not men. They're gods <laughs> up on Mount Olympus. Yes, with the other Greek gods. Yep, Hercules. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, manufactured hardship not something not something that we excel no, at here. No, uh, you know, doing it for the just for the sake of doing it. There's always an educational outcome that we're trying to achieve through hardship, yeah. right? Um, unless say say we're on a trail and all of a sudden, uh, I think when you were a student, we were up at a remote campsite on the river and then it snowed like rain for two days and then snowed rain for two days and then snowed for a day. So we had like eight inches of snow and. You know, that was, there's nothing we could do to, to change that situation. No. But, you know, that's where, you know, people's knots and tarps and gear was severely tested. Yeah, it matters. And, you know, a lot of them failed, right? A lot of things collapsed. And yeah, and some young idiot, I won't say who, was just sleeping under a canoe and was very cold for three days. Really? Yeah, I don't know who that young idiot was. It was me. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, it was, there was a lot of learning going on on that Lots trip. Lots of learning. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> if you think back to something in your own past, right? Think about when you had, or, you know, the most learning in the shortest amount of time probably was due to some sort of hardship or extreme challenge, mm -hmm. right? That if you were, you know, you're not going to become amazingly better at tying knots and setting up tarps in, in snow conditions by sitting on a couch, right? No. You have to be out actively doing it. Yes. And that's the uh, that's the point of the exercise. So, so while most of the modern world will worship comfort and things, uh, that's not we don't pray to that god here. We do pray to the god of challenge to some extent. Hercules, yeah, <laughs> Hercules, who when he was acting like a jerk became Jer Jercules. 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 Uh, someone once told me that if I were a Greek god, I would be Jercules, and I thought it was very funny. Yeah. So what we have coming up, I guess that'll wrap up that topic there. Yeah. Um, but what we have coming up for our final two weeks of the semester, we've got a ton of wrap-up stuff to do during week eight. Um, sleeping out in front of a in front of a fire with no blankets, stuff yeah. like that. We've got to finish a bunch of projects. We've got pack baskets on the go. We've got crooked knives on the go right now. And then week nine, we head out and do our solos at an undisclosed location deep in the North Main Woods. And that is a great culminating exercise for people. Um, the feedback that we get from the solo experience is always very positive in that, you know, people being sort of welcome home, welcomed home to life in the forest. Uh, because, you know, the forest, from our perspective, the forest, the natural world is home. Yeah. You know, it's a little... Maybe not super commonly held in the modern world, but uh, we firmly believe that around here. Yeah, and it, and what I find amazing about the if you know when these people when not these people when students show up often uh, if you week one told them that they were going to go spend three nights out on their own that'd be a little intimidating. And then when I was out with half of the students over the last few days, that was all they talked about is how excited they were to go out and do this thing solo and really you know put what they've learned into practice on their own. And that's, that's a great thing to see that that's that growth we were talking about this whole time is that seeing that happen is really, really, it's why we do this, right? Yeah. It's rewarding for yeah. certain. Cool. Well, 
I think that's about all we've got this week, this morning. Um, we're off to drink more coffee and make more bad jokes around the fire mm-hmm. today. And decisions. And, and bad decisions. <laughs> Uh, so we hope you enjoyed listening to us this morning. Thanks for spending the time with us and we will hit you back again with another one real soon. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. You have been listening to the Jack Mountain Bushcraft podcast. For more information on our professional wilderness guide training programs that are college accredited and GI Bill approved, Visit us on the web at jackmtn.com.